In 2010, three kids sitting in a dorm room in California smoking weed off their heads decided to post some pretty damaging photos online. Now, they didn't think much about it until the day after where hell broke loose as the parents were flicking through the photos on Facebook. I wish we could retract these photos, they agreed. And that, guess what, was the birth of Snapchat. Today, a $100 billion company. Now, I would argue that the foundation of Snapchat is what many successful entrepreneurs are re reflecting. It was founded by people who themselves were the customers of their own product. They truly felt their pain, came up with a solution, recruited like-minded peers, and even down the road, as Mark Zuckerberg waved a $10 billion, $3 billion check in front of them, declined because the principles of their company were in danger. In fact, what I claim is that the strength of startups is the ability to emphasize with its audience. What's fascinating is that there is a direct correlation between empathy and common sense, both defined as seeing the world from another person's point of view. But as companies grow bigger, Empathy fades away, and with that, common sense is replaced with nonsense, often paralyzing it all and basically increasingly giving birth to what we today will talk about, which is the frozen middle. That is the topic of today's conversation, and I can't think about anyone better suited to discuss this than our two guests. So let's run the Eminem Show. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome to all our viewers across the world, our World Business Forum audience, and all our Chief Executive Magazine readers. I'm Martin Lindstrom, your co-host, and along with my iconic and dear friend, the world's number one leadership coach, Marshall Goldsmith. Now, Marshall is a member of the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame and has written some of the best and most iconic books out there, including, by the way, his latest New York Times bestseller, The Earned Life, Lose Regret to Fulfillment. 
And I just have to say one thing, the book is amazing. And yes, I'm being paid for saying it, but I mean it at the same time. No, I mean, it's not paying anything, yeah. but I have to say that book is absolutely a mind blowing book. So you have to read it. Now, beside all these fancy credentials, I have to say that more important than anything, Marshall is just an amazing human being. So Marshall, thanks again for showing up. Um, wow. The New York Times visiting book once again, I don't know how you do it. Ah, uh, lots of work. Thank you so much. Thank you for all your support. And I am here with my colleague, Martin Lindstrom. Martin Lindstrom is the world's most interesting human being, the world's <laughs> most interesting person. And Aisha is a good friend. Aisha, you got to get to know this guy. He uh, is crazier than hell, but other than that, I love him, right? So he's the world's most interesting person. He's also Thinkers 50 person, one of the best business thinkers in the world, one of the Time Magazine most 100 most influential people in the world, only the world though, only the world. And he's author of books like Biology, The Ministry of Common Sense, and also is just a good human being, good human being, interesting, and also I'd say one of the most creative people I've ever met. So, you know, very honored to be on this show with Martin. And Martin does an amazing job of producing this show. I don't know how he does it. Yay. Thank you, Marcel. And you managed to make me blush in just 60 seconds. So thank you for that. That's really kind of you. And does, do you know what? He does this every second week. Which is, <laughs> that's the reason why I love this show. You know. Now, if you have any questions or comments, just post them here or just tell us who you are and where you are. And if you, by the way, like this show, don't forget to press the like, the follow, or the subscribe button. Now, Marshall, I know you have a very special relationship with our first guest, right? Uh, we're, we're not talking about like, we're talking love here. Lots of love. So <laughs> let me introduce Aisha Evans. I love Aisha. She is a wonderful, wonderful person. She is from Senegal, Africa, speaks a bunch of languages, an expert in technology. She's won all kinds of awards like the you know, most powerful women in America and all kinds of other technology things. She was at Intel where she was a chief strategy officer. She had all kinds of other interesting jobs. And now she also has one of the world's interesting jobs. She is the CEO of Zook. And you know, Martin, a comment you made about small company, big company, well, she was in a small company. <laughs> at Zooks, and now it's part of a big company called Amazon, so you can't, she's gone from way small to about as big as you can get, so one of the world's most interesting people, Let, let's hear it from Aisha, yay, very good, now Aisha, Aisha, I have a question, yes sir, just See you. Give us a little of your story, here's some girl from Senegal, way back where, ending up being a CEO of this company in the U.S., what happened? Tell us just a little of your journey. So, I mean, I, I had a, an incredible support system at all stages um, in Senegal with my parents who uh, exposed me to uh, technology and education uh, in France through seeing now what technology could make possible. Uh, and then uh, in the U.S. Uh, with uh, people like you uh, coaching me through things, uh, my husband supporting me. So I would say... Uh, three things, an incredible support system at all phases of the journey, an insatiable curiosity about things and how they work and what they make possible and how can I participate in them, so drawing a sense of purpose. And I would say last but not least, a lot of risk-taking and adap adapting and learning how to uh, handle difficult situations and, and failure and turn them, in, turn them into fuel as opposed to uh, being held back. That's really the essence of my journey. That's wonderful. It's absolutely amazing, I have to say. I'm, listen, uh, in my opening of, of this show, I talked a lot about the big and the small comedy. Now for me, Amazon is all about retail and e-commerce and cloud management. How does a self-driving car fit into that picture? I mean, it seems to be two different worlds somehow, right? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very fair representation. So I think when we think about Amazon uh, and Zooks, first, we should abstract. Yes, it's e-commerce and it's AWS, but Amazon is a transportation company. Uh, they transport goods to you or they transport compute to you or they transport uh, entertainment to you. And Zooks is a transportation company too. It just happens to use autonomy to serve 
transportation. So I think in terms of mindset and in terms of long-term orientation, that's where the alignment is. Uh, as we've, we will discuss uh, in, this, uh, in this session, it's hard for big companies to grow and, uh, and stay innovative. And Zooks allows uh, one of the vectors of uh, growth and risk-taking and really innovation for Amazon. And so that's really, it's as simple as that. It's those two reasons. And we've been left very independent to go pursue the mission, understanding that once we put points on the board on the mission and establish the foundation, there will be synergies, but those are step two, not step one. You know, I, I could ask you about a thousand questions, but I'm gonna limit myself. I'm supposed to ask one, but I'm gonna cheat and ask two anyway. All right, so uh, the first question is, I think you're just a wonderful role model. And I remember I had a very touching conversation with you after you got that Most Powerful Women Award. I started crying, it was really moving. And, you know, just you're a role model for girls, for people in minorities. And, you know, I'm so proud to know you. Just what advice do you have for those maybe younger people listening in or the people that had to overcome something? First of all, thank you for the kind words. I, I would not be where I am without you. So I appreciate you. I love you. Frankly, you know that. Um, I would say, oh, the, the first thing is uh, don't let the environment define you. Yeah. Find what you're passionate about. Find what you're curious about. Find what makes you tick. And by the way, you'll see it both in your professional life as well as in your personal life. Right. And pursue that. And find people who will advise you, support you, educate you, challenge you, question you. And by support, I don't mean latent support, a phone call from here and then to just be a, like a shrink for you. Sorry to use that language. Yeah, yeah. But people who will sponsor you, people who will help you. And ask them for help to go pursue that mission. If you do that, I promise great things will happen. You know, I I kind of love not just what you're doing from a kind of fun technology point of view, but from a higher purpose point of view. So if you look at Zooks, I think there really is a wonderful higher purpose there. Can you kind of share that with the, the people? Yeah, uh, for us, uh, it's really, this is about using autonomy uh, to change the mobility on demand business uh, so that you have essentially the most efficient and effective way of going from point A to point B. We do not sell you a vehicle. We sell you a ride in a purpose-built vehicle that basically was re-architected and redesigned for AI to do the driving because your car of today is architected for a human to do the driving. And so higher purpose, safety, we tolerate an incredible amount of fat fatalities due to crashes that are totally avoidable. The environment, at least, hopefully we're now at the point where we no longer debate that we have an environmental problem and we need to take care of Mother Earth and especially for future generation. Um, productivity. Why do we spend 400 billion hours driving as humans, we could use those hours to do way more important things. And then just congestions and cities. I mean, you look at our cities today, unless we're willing, at least in the United States, and frankly, around the world, unless we're willing to, re to destroy them and rebuild them, they currently cannot sustain life and economic pursuit for all of us on Earth. And then the, the, the fifth one is economic access. I truly believe that human beings use transportation, whether it's virtual transportation, the internet, or physical transportation, they use that to access knowledge, to share knowledge, which creates upward economic mobility, which I think will leave us in a much better world. So those are the five reasons why it's a little grandiose, but we think we can affect society and how life is lived. I have to say, this is absolutely fascinating. <clears throat> now, I have to say one thing as well. We are right now in a second going to introduce you for another person which is linked with, I say, in a way I had not imagined. So, okay, coming up, what are the secret ingredients in a powerful real race? Now, the answer probably will shock you, at least it did with me. 
So that leads me to our second guest for today's show. And I have to say that I'm a very big fan of our next guest. It is Yves Moreau, who time after time adds a pioneering view on organizational thinking. Eve is the director of Boston Consulting Group's Institute of Organization. He's an expert in the corporate transformation and leads the firm's development of behavioral groundwork for competitive change. Now, Eve was and is a BCG follower from 2008 until today. Eve is also the author of Six Simple Rules, How to Manage Complexity Without Getting Complicated. Welcome, Eve. Hello, Martin. Hello, friends. Nice to meet now, you. Thank you. Listen, I have to say one thing. I met you the first time through a video not a Teams call, but a viral video, which I too would like to share with everyone because I think it's brilliant what you're saying here. So before I ask you any questions, let's watch this. World Championship Final Women Eight teams in the final The fastest team is the US team They have the fastest women on earth they are the favorite team to win. Notably, if you compare them to an average team, say the French team, <laughs> based on their best performance in the 100 meter race, if you add the individual times of the US runners, they arrive at the finish line 3.2 meters ahead of the French team. And this year, the US team is in great shape. Sylvia dans le virage. Sylvia Dutis, uh, Sylvia Pellic qui se bat. Qui va chercher Christine, allez Christine. Allez Christine Aron. Allez, allez, allez Christine Aron. Contre les états unis ça va être juste dans les bois. Allez Christine, allez, allez, allez. Allez, 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 allez. Ça va passer. Elles sont championnes du monde. Championnes du monde. 41 à 78. Record pulvérisé. So what happened? The fastest team did not win. The slower one did. By the way, I hope you appreciate the deep historical search I did to make the French look good. Huh? <laughs> it's not, uh, but it's, let's not exaggerate, it's not archaeology either. Huh? Okay. So, but why? Because of cooperation. You know, when you hear this sentence, thanks to cooperation, the whole is worth more than the sum of the parts. This is not poetry. This is not philosophy. This is math. Those who carry the baton are slower, but their baton is faster. Miracle of cooperation. It multiplies energy, intelligence in human efforts. It is the essence of human efforts how we work together, how each effort contributes to the effort of others. With cooperation, we can do more with less. Wow, that's charming, Eve. And I have to say what Eve have in common with Aisha will surprise you because guess what? They both come from the Ivory Coast, from Senegal. So here we go. We have two amazing individuals on the show. And I have to ask you, Eve, a question about this topic you just shared with now. We talked about the paradox of the frozen middle. How does that play into this topic we just discussed here? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the frozen middle, uh, mid managers uh, between the top and frontline managers is where teamwork is designed, is created. And there is a paradox because it is precisely when change is the most vital for companies, that those the best placed to carry out that change, to drive that change, middle managers are the least likely to do it. Why? So it's obvious why change is so important today. And Aisha, in her conversation earlier, she also discussed, you know, digital, the need for autonomy, uh, of course, sustainability, the productivity issue. We need change. Just productivity, uh, productivity improvement has been divided by five, by 10, sorry, by 10 over the last 50 years. It used to be 5% per annum. It is 0 0.5 today. So we need to change. And as you know, with volatility, 
change is more uh, frequent, uh, so uh, it's becoming endemic. And middle managers, uh, they are between the top leaders who give the long-term direction for change and the frontline managers who lead day-to-day -day operations. So the continuity, the link is provided by the by uh, mid managers. And uh, the problem is that today they are less and less engaged. Huh? They are even sometimes what we call actively disengaged. That is, they actively disengage frontline people reporting to them. You know, uh, the top has launched a new initiative. Yeah, but don't bother. Don't bother. It will be superseded by a new one uh, soon. So this is active disengagement. They they tend sometimes all too often to exact. You know, in the uh, bottom-up communication, exaggerate the constraints, even going for remote work, team uh, Zoom, you know, teams, uh, hybrid, oh, the teams will never accept, it will not uh, work, you know, and, and look, at what's look at what has happened, it, it worked. So why is this happening? Why these frozen mid-managers that are uh, actively disengaged, not engaged enough, sometimes uh, cascading top-down communication in a selective way, exaggerating uh, constraints uh, from the bottom in their communication. Very often what we hear as an explanation is, well, you know, these mid managers, they don't have the capabilities first. Uh, second, they tend to protect their position. They are protective of their position. Uh, third, they are change resistance. They resist change. And that's why you have this paradox. Those who those supposed to be the catalyst of change are the inhibitor of change. And this is totally wrong. All these explanations are wrong. You know, capabilities, uh, resistance, protection, they are wrong. And because the explanations are wrong, the solutions are also wrong. And you have a vicious circle where we put mid managers in a more and more impossible situation. You know, just resistance. People are, people resist change. How often do we hear that? This is wrong. You know, people change style. You know, during the talk, I looked at Marshall's, Marshall's look 20 years ago. You know, Marshall at the time was not wearing a beard. Marshall has changed his style. So people change style, they change cars. They change houses, they change jobs, they even change husband or wife. So, you know, as long as change is beneficial, people don't resist change. What is going on in reality? In reality, we have put mid managers in an impossible situation. You know, companies face more and more business complexity. The world has become more complex. We have measured it with our teams. We have measured the world has become six times more complex, you know, to attract customers, keep customers, create value for customers. We need to satisfy more and more requirements. We need affordability, reliability, speed, innovation, efficiency, personalization, standardization, compliance, risk management, global consistency, local response. And companies respond by becoming more and more complicated to this new complexity. They respond with increased exponential complicatedness, more and more structure, processes, systems, scorecards, metrics, committees, full reporting lines, solid reporting lines, dotted lines, shared service centers, hubs, clusters, headquarters, countries. Now, where is the area where you have maximum complicatedness, mean managers? It is where the intricacy of RACI procedures, committees, dotted lines, full lines, is the densest, is the thickest. This is where all the lines cross in the middle. You know, the lines, they start from the top. So it's simple at the top. At the bottom, operations, 
you have mainly full reporting lines because you know people who are operating machines, you want them to report solidly. You don't want them to operate the machine in a dotted way to produce dotted goods. So all this intricacy, all this complicatedness is the densest, is the thickest in the middle. And these poor mid managers are disempowered. You know, recently, recent, a true story. I was, for my work, interviewing a mid manager in charge of sales in a country. So it's a multinational company, different countries, sales manager. And she was telling me, you know, Eve, uh, last week on the Wednesday, I was working late on something. And the head of the country, the GM, the general manager, pushed my door at about 10 p.m. And she told me, I have seen you working very late, Monday, Tuesday, tonight. What is it? What are you doing? And I told him, look, I have been asked by our regional sales director to whom I report with a dotted line, because to you both, I report with a solid line. We have been asked to answer this question with this approach. And all the sales managers in the different countries reporting to this region, we have to answer this question in that way. The GM looked at the question, said, oh, that's a stupid question. He has asked you to answer. And that's a stupid way to answer the question. Then I told him, well, perhaps we should tell him because that's that takes a lot of my time. Perhaps you should tell the regional sales director that said, no, 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 no. It would be too complicated. We would have to escalate. No, do it, but quick and dirty. Don't be a perfectionist because you have other things to do. What do you do when you are supposed to do something quick and dirty? Use your intelligence to moderate your intelligence and don't be a perfectionist. Do something in a dotted way. What? Do? So the guy spent, and then on the Saturday, he told me, I saw my son because I had not seen my son for the whole week. I was working very late. And my son told me on Saturday, Dad, I have not seen you this week. You were, you were working very late. Was it interesting? I didn't dare to tell him it was stupid. <laughs> this is the nightmare in which we put oh. mid managers. Wow. And then, and then we asked HR, you know, HR, human, come with solutions. And HR, uh, we try to give them coaching lessons, but they are not as good as Marshall, you know, usually because you know, there, are, there is one Marshall, but, you know, you have many uh, mid managers. We cannot offer a great coach to each of them. So you try to coach them, you know, on their, their personality style, their leadership style. It doesn't work. So then we try to enrich the employee value proposition, you know, to excite these poor mid managers and we send them surveys. What would excite you to get a free subscription to a gym club, to receive free uh, gym uh, fitness equipment at home, uh, to have concierge services uh, for your laundry when you work late, to take cooking lessons, you know, these poor guys. They are, this is the real issue, you know, this complicatedness. I'm, so, not, I'm not sure, Marshall, if you, uh, <clears throat> if you feel a certain passion from Eve on this particular topic. Well, <laughs> there's a little bit, right? That, what's your, this is fascinating stuff. Thanks. You. No, Marshall, share some of the questions you have here. Well, you know, my question is, um, I am not in the macro level transformation business. And so I can tell you, I work with individuals and just try to help them have a better life and change, which is hard enough, by the way. That's not easy in and of itself. Um, how do you get people, let's assume the CEO buys into your plan. Uh, you've got a good plan, the CEO buys into it. To me, a, a real challenge is how do you execute? How do you get people to stick with the plan day after day after day? So as you said, it's not one of these bozo programs where everybody listens to speeches and jumps up and down and claps and then a year later, nothing happens, right? How do you get people to actually stick with the plan so that they actually execute on the ideas that you deliver. And I, Martin, I don't have a clue what the answer to that question is, but it's a nice question. It's a very it's a nice, nice question. question. <laughs> it's a very nice question. Uh, it's a difficult one. Huh? Uh, that's why between 70 and 80% of change efforts fail, huh, by the way, huh? because we all have a plan usually, but sticking to the plan 
and adjusting the plan along the way is difficult. But based on our experience, I would say that uh, we have to, uh, again, empower mid manager. The frozen middle has a vital role to play in transformation. And very often, precisely, these are those that we trap in this complicated uh, labyrinth uh, of the organization. So by removing complicatedness as much as possible, you allow people to manage complexity. That's the whole idea. How can we enable people to face complexity? You know, what it takes to attract customers, keep customers without spending their time, their energy, their intelligence, dealing with internal complicatedness. Then they will stick to the plan. But very often, along the plan, you have noise. You have disruptions that are created by this complicatedness. You know, even to take a decision based on our analysis, on average, you need seven approvals. To to even I know a company to change a light bulb in the office, you need seven approvals from the facility manager, the supervisor, the safety manager, the compliance manager to make sure there is no corruption by light bulbs, the, the technicians, the, the category manager, the operational buyer. How can you stick to the plan, execute the transformation strategy in the middle of this complicatedness? So remove the complicatedness, then you enable mid managers to play their vital role in summary, I would say. And, and Eva, I have to say that you could just as well have written my, my book, The Minister of Common Sense, absolutely for sure. Okay, coming up, how does it feel to be swallowed by one of the world's largest companies? Whoa, the answer, I think, will surprise you. Now, I have to ask you, um, Asa, what were you most afraid of when selling your company to Amazon? And did that, by the way, turn out to be a valid concern? Um, I would say I was afraid of, I was afraid that I was being naive. Because during, uh, during the acquisition, there's all people, you know, it's a little bit of a dating situation. You hear what you want to hear and you're told what you want to hear. And so the reason I'm mentioning that first is because the, the, the deeply rooted fear was that we were just going to go into this mammoth company machine. They have processes, they have established people. And, uh, and we were just going to kind of get blown up in there. And I don't mean structurally. I mean, lose the focus, lose the ability to execute, lose the ability to take risk and just be bogged down. So that was uh, the biggest fear. And uh, I hope it's a, it's a fair fear. Um, it turned out to actually to be un unfounded. Um, it's been two years. So I feel like there, you know, that's uh, 24 months, enough of a track record there. And uh, I'm really grateful uh, to Amazon and I'm also proud of them because when they said you're going to be an independent subsidiary, they meant it. And they've also often said at the highest level of the company, look, if we knew how to solve this problem or how to realize this opportunity, we would have done it. So uh, we bought this company to make that happen. We need to leave you alone uh, to go make that happen. And then at some point when it makes sense to talk, you know, synergies and what have you, then let's talk about it. So they're like, exec focus, execute, get to market and scale. That's your mission. And I've even been warned by some executives, like, do not come back to us and tell us that this super important thing didn't happen because somebody, I don't know in which corner of Amazon, who's supposedly important, told you to go do X, Y, Z. You, you figure out a nice professional way to kind of keep focused and they've structured the company this way and we've operated this way. Now, you know, I've got a question that I got a question. that's going to try to connect two dots. That's the dot about the frozen middle and what you're talking about. And this is something I always found puzzling. I'm going to ramble a little bit. I came up with an idea, the idea called inside outsourcing. So I would go to these HR people say, why don't you, yeah, I say, if you could run the function yourself like a business, could you do it better and cheaper? Invariably say, oh, much better and much cheaper. I said, fine. So why don't we just do something called inside outsourcing? You do it like yourself, run it like a business and it'd be better and cheaper in life. And then, well, then what I got back was, well, what about my pension plan and retirement? And, and I realized these people are so security conscious 
there's no way in hell they're going to do this, right? Because that's why they went into this corporate job in the first place. Now, from your experience, because you've been in a big corporation too, so you've been on both sides of this equation, and you were at Intel, which is not a small company. How can you address what he said about creating this entrepreneurial spirit in a larger company? Any suggestions? So I think minimize, there has to be company infrastructure because otherwise it, it kind of goes out of control. But being ruthless about having the minimal level of company infrastructure needed. And I mean ruthless, just eliminate the stupid processes and what I call the minions whose job it is to operate the process machine. Step one. Step two, try to have a, 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 a minimum lovable breakdown of the different things that need to be accomplished. Right. Then create teams and tell them, this is what you need to accomplish. How, what has to be true for you to do that? What do you need to do that? How do you do that? And how do we measure it so that we can meet from time to time to see whether it's happening or not? If you do that, amazing things will happen. Gotcha. Now, I, I got a question for both of you on the micro level, which always interests me the most. That is the same phenomena that you both have been discussing occurs at the micro human level. What happens, you get into middle management, you're comfortable. You're making money, uh, you're making the house payments, uh, you're doing pretty well. And then all of a sudden the conservative factor starts kicking in where you don't want to lose your job. And then you end up becoming kind of what both of you have been talking about. So now let's forget about what the corporation can do. Think about that individual human being in the middle who's pretty comfortable and maybe a little insecure, wants to keep the job, pay the mortgage. How can that person change on the inside? Aisha, any thoughts on that one? Well, I, I think it's it's there are, there are two things that are important here. So thing one is know what type of middle manager you are. Okay. If you are the executing kind, then be comfortable taking orders and execute and make it, make them happen. Right. If you are the ambitious kind, then be careful to not become what I call a prisoner of your ambition, mm. where you are so scared that your ambition is not going to come through that you start sub optimizing things because you're afraid to mm. me. If you are in a position of driving the change, you have to be fearless and you have to have a one-on-one -on -one with yourself about the fact that you're going to be okay no matter what. Because if you don't do, I mean, it happens to me. Nobody wants to fail. But if, if you don't push yourself so you can help the team through the transition, then that's a problem. And so one of those things you've taught me is I always have to be ready for the fact that if this doesn't work out, something else will, because that then brings you the freedom to go execute the change. And if you're a middle manager who doesn't like to do that, then just be happy taking orders. I like I love it. it. Listen, Eve, any reflections on this? No, I, I wouldn't have been able to come up with such a brilliant, such brilliant answers as Aisha did. Uh, seriously, uh, what she told us, uh, me, my, uh, you know, I am less, you know, again, uh, that's why we have different jobs. Marshall is a coach dealing with individuals. Me, I don't deal with individuals. You know, I, I, I deal with what he, would, he was talking about, the micro. Me, I deal with the meso, which right. is, you know, the interactions between teams or between leaders and teams, the interaction, the relationship. That's why I'm working on relational productivity at the moment. So, to be frank, I don't really know what it takes to change the individual or what they have to do individually. I am look, more looking at the context of their interaction, their interplay. Uh, and that's why I, I defer to Aisha's answer. Uh, I have to admit my limit. <laughs> well, I think there's another question you probably can answer very quickly because I think it's time to run the BC team. And eventually ask Marching Hackman, the CEO of Tommy Hilfiger, the world's leading clothing and apparel company, to ask today's BCT Minute. So let's run that. Hello, everybody. My name is Martijn Hachman. I'm CEO of Tommy Hilfiger Global and BVH Europe. 
Now, my question for the M&M panel is quite simple. Based on your experience, what are the three most important factors in driving change? Now, um, Eve, I promise you, you should be the man answering this. What is your reflections here? Well, um, so three, he said, okay. <laughs> First one I would say is make change concrete, not abstract. Very often when we talk about change, we talk about decentralization, centralization, customer centricity. This is abstract, you know. Uh, if you are a railway, putting trains on time, that is concrete. So make change concrete. If you are an airline, seamless traveling, seamless traveling, this is concrete. Centralization, decentralization, customer centricity, abstract, be concrete. Second, be specific. What we did, what will it mean for you as a train driver? What will be the benefits of this change? Well, if trains are on time, you will be able to be back home on time. You will master your personal work-life balance. If you are a station manager and trains are on time, customers will not shout at you. They will not, you know, you will, you will have better relationships with your customers, even with your, so make change specific, function by function, level by level. And three, make it time framed you know what do we want to have changed by when in nine months not in a philosophical way in the absolute so change needs to be concrete specific and time framed i would say that's my answer now is it you um <clears throat> you've seen the the intel insights inside you know what we're talking about when it comes to big and i'm sure pretty complex and slow organizations what is your reflection to the question i would say the uh, uh everything that's that eve said and i would add a couple of things um uh break it down into some steps because as you break it down into some steps you can celebrate and show the beginning of the promise and the benefit and that fuels people to then go to the next phase of it the next phase of it until Next thing you know, it's uh, it's accomplished. But the benefit map that he talked, that Eve talked about, is really important. I think too many times, people will only do part of the benefit. Like, how does it benefit the corporation? Well, okay, that's important, obviously. But then take that extra step of saying that benefit to the corporation will mean X, Y, Z to you. Everybody on the value chain who has to do work for the change needs to understand the benefit and needs to relate to it. Exactly. Excellent. I love it. I absolutely love it. Now, <clears throat> I have to say to all of you guys and apologize for my voice. What we are going to do now is the ultimate challenge because in a second, we are going to summarize this. But before doing that, I just want to say thank you to our guest. Marshall, any reflections on what you heard here? Yeah, one word came to mind. The word that came to mind for me is courage. And I should talk about courage on the micro level, courage for her as a human being, the recommendation of courage for others. Eve is talking about, you know, the courage to take risks, the courage to delegate, the courage. I mean, it's easy to say empower people, but that involves risk. And it's a lot easier to say, I'll just do it myself, which may involve at least perceived less risk. So I think the word that hits mine for both of them on different dimensions is the word of courage. Just, you know, do it because it's the right thing to do have the courage to do it and then stick with the plan and, 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 and execute. So those are a couple of thoughts. Beautiful. Well, I think it's time to run the mural summary. So here we are once again, and I'm left with the impossible duty to summarize what two geniuses have said in 30 minutes, so I'm going to give it a go. Now, the first thing I remember Evie's talked about was how productivity has been divided by five, I think by even 10. over 30, by 10, even worse. Why, can you imagine how the complexity now have penetrated through the system? And of course, what we talked about was, this is leading to the frozen middle. So I'm going to summarize the input I heard from both parties with a concrete solution. So let's first of all, 
just do a little model here of how an organization could look like on the very top we have top management then we have the middle that's where we call it the frozen middle here right now and then we have the let's call it junior workforce i'm trying to be politically correct here now i think the biggest issue we've seen and we heard about that during the conversation was companies when they become complex are seeing the world from inside out and that's exactly what Marshall talked about. You no, know, if you should outsource yourself, how would you look at this? Well, that's where he's forcing people to see the world from outside in. So she's changing the perspective, but that could also be that you're asking your customers more. And I think the issue is a lot of companies in general have lost contact with the customers. So they see the world more from inside out than outside in. So that will be my little change of the model here. Now here's the issue. How do you then change this? And this is what, Isaac came back to. Isaac basically said, hey, we need to break things down to small steps. And small steps, in my opinion, cannot talk, we cannot just do that from top down. Because as uh, we heard, uh, you know, we heard about the whole idea about if it's top down, what we are leading up to is that the frozen middle is manipulating the message and deviating it in the wrong way. So I would actually claim we should almost do a bottom up and the bottom up is the idea of saying, well, why don't we put in small interventions? A little bit of what I say is saying here, small, perhaps 90 day interventions. And these are 90 day interventions really should start from bottom up. They are proof points. And these proof points really are giving a sense of hope. And I should talk a lot about, let's celebrate those proof points. And what I think both people said, and even in particular, let's make it measurable let's make it concrete and let's put in a timeline here. So it's very short, very concise, and it has an immediate effect. Don't go for the long winded two year plans because people do not have the patience for that. And here's what I'm taking out of this. Don't do it once, do it twice, do it three times, do it four times, right? Because as you do it through the organization, what happens is that you slowly are creating a sense of movement internally in the company where people sort of start to see hope in the end of the tunnel. They're not going to say, oh, change is impossible here. They're going to say, my God, people in the other division that just did it, what well, I feel kind of a pressure to do this. And that's again where I'll go back to why I said, well, let's celebrate this. And if you can celebrate through the system, you also use that as a kind of peer pressure. And the peer pressure is setting a new behavioral pattern within the organization. It's basically changing the default behavior into a new behavior. And this may be the answer why most companies are failing and why productivity is so low, because we have two long-term horizons. We don't look at it from top down. We forget about the outside in, but look at it from inside out. And we let things become increasingly complex because we think complexity is solving complexity. My God, this was a long with the summary, but there was a lot which was said here. That was the mule summary. Yay. You're brilliant. <clears throat> Thank you. On a falling note, before I lose my voice, I just want to say to all of you guys, check out martinlinsom.com slash MM for the show notes and hundreds of free videos from our mini shows and free tools and books. And by the way, I want to say that uh, we actually have uh, very soon also from Eve a free chapter for his next book. It's not being released yet, which is talking about productivity. So that's amazing stuff. Check it out on this address and you can scan the QR code. And then I just want to say thank you to our two amazing guests. Um, amazing to have you here and well done on all your hard work. Thanks, Marshall. As always, I just want to say to all of you guys that because we have so much demand for our shows, we actually are now introducing what we call the m, &M throwback, where we'll go down memory lane and pick the best sound bites from experts across the world. And you can watch this, by the way, the next one on the 19th of July at 12 noon. Do you want to watch the trailer? Take a look at this. And for the rest of you, I just want to say again, we'll be back again the 9th of August, 2022. So it's just in a couple of months from now, or a week from now, on, and we'll have some amazing guests on it. If you want to find out who it is, just go to our show notes. Take care. We'll be back again soon. Bye for now and stay safe. Hey. Oh.
every day is a new challenge, right? Is uh, a day that we can prepare ourselves even more. This is about leadership as a mindset. We do work that matters for people who care. We live in the age of the idea.